The whole of Elrond's house was filled with folk, elves for the most part, though there were few guests of other sorts. Elrond, as was his custom, sat in a great chair at the end of the long table upon the dais. And next to him, on the one side sat Glorfindel, and on the other side sat Gandalf. Frodo looked at them in wonder, for he had never before seen Elrond, of whom so many tales spoke. And as they sat upon his right hand and his left, Glorfindel and even Gandalf, whom he thought he knew so well, were revealed as lords of dignity and power. Gandalf was shorter in stature than the other two, but his long white hair, his sweeping silver beard, and his broad shoulders made him look like some wise king of ancient legend. In his aged face under great snowy brows, his dark eyes were set like coals that could leap suddenly into fire. Glorfindel was tall and straight. His hair was of shining gold, his face fair and young and fearless and full of joy. His eyes were bright and keen, and his voice like music. On his brow sat wisdom, and in his hand was strength. The face of Elrond was ageless, neither old nor young. Though in it was written the memory of many things both glad and sorrowful. His hair was dark as the shadows of twilight, and upon it was set a circlet of silver. His eyes were grey as a clear evening, and in them was a light like the light of stars. Venerable, he seemed as a king crowned with many winters, and yet hale as a tried warrior in the fullness of his strength. He was the Lord of Rivendell, and mighty among both elves and men. In the middle of the table, against the woven cloths upon the wall, there was a chair under a canopy, and there sat a lady fair to look upon, and so like was she in form of womanhood to Elrond, that Frodo guessed that she was one of his close kindred. Young she was, and yet not so. The braids of her dark hair were touched by no frost. Her white arms and clear face were flawless and smooth, and the light of stars was in her bright eyes, grey as a cloudless night. Yet queenly she looked and thought and knowledge were in her glance, as of one who has known many things that the years bring. Above her brow her head was covered with a cap of silver lace netted with small gems, glittering white, but her soft grey raiment had no ornament save a girdle of leaves wrought in silver. So it was that Frodo saw her whom few mortals had yet seen, Arwen, daughter of Elrond, in whom it was said that the likeness of Luthien had come on earth again, and she was called Undomiel, for she was the even star of her people. Long she had been in the land of her mother's kin, in Lorien, beyond the mountains, and was but lately returned to Rivendell, to her father's house. But her brothers, Eladan and Elro here, were out upon errantry, for they rode often far afield with the rangers of the north, forgetting never their mother's torment in the dens of the orcs. Such loveliness and living thing Frodo had never seen before, nor imagined in his mind, and he was both surprised and abashed to find that he had a seat at Elrond's table among all these folk so high and fair. Though he had a suitable chair and was raised upon several cushions, he felt very small, and rather out of place, but that feeling quickly passed. The feast was merry, and the food all that his hunger could desire. It was some time before he looked about him again, or even turned to his neighbors. He looked first for his friends. Sam had begged to be allowed to wait on his master, but had been told that for this time he was a guest of honor. Frodo can see him now, sitting with Pippin and Merry at the upper end of one of the side tables close to the dais. He could see no sign of Strider. Next to Frodo, on his right, sat a dwarf of important appearance, richly dressed. His beard, very long and forked, was white, nearly as white as the snow-white cloth of his garments. He wore a silver belt, and round his neck hung a chain of silver and diamonds. Frodo stopped eating to look at him. Welcome and well met, said the dwarf, turning towards him. Then he actually rose from his seat and bowed. Gloin, at your service, he said and bowed still lower. Frodo Baggins at your service and your families, said Frodo correctly, rising in surprise and scattering his cushions. Am I right in guessing that you are the Glowing, one of the twelve companions of the great Thorin Oakenshield? 
quite right, answered the dwarf, gathering up the cushions and courteously assisting Frodo back into his seat. And I do not ask, for I have already been told that you are the kinsman and adopted heir of our friend Bilbo the Renowned. Allow me to congratulate you on your recovery. Thank you very much, said Frodo. You have had some very strange adventures, I hear, said Gloin. I wonder greatly what brings four hobbits on so long a journey. Nothing like it has happened since Bilbo came with us, but perhaps I should not inquire too closely since Elrond and Gandalf do not seem disposed to talk of this. I think we will not speak of it, at least not yet, said Frodo politely. He guessed that even in Elrond's house, the matter of the ring was not one for casual talk, and in any case he wished to forget his troubles for a time. But I am equally curious, he added, to learn what brings so important a dwarf so far from the Lonely Mountain. Gloin looked at him. If you have not heard, I think we will not yet speak of that either. Master Elrond will summon us all ere long, I believe, and then we shall all hear many things. But there is much else that may be told. Throughout the rest of the meal they talked together, but Frodo listened more than he spoke, for the news of the Shire, apart from the ring, seemed small and far away, and unimportant, while Gloin had much to tell of events in the northern regions of Wilderland. Frodo learned that Grimbeon the Old, son of Beon, was now the lord of many sturdy men, and to their land between the mountains and Mirkwood neither orc nor wolf dared to go. Indeed, said Gloin. If it were not for the Beornings, the passage from Dale to Rivendell would long ago have become impossible. They are valiant men and keep open the high pass and the ford of Carrock. Ah, but their toes are high, he added with a shake of his head. And like Bairn of old, they are not over fond of dwarves. Still, they are trusty, and that is much in these days. Nowhere are there any men so friendly to us as the men of Dale. They are good folk from the Bardings. The grandson of Bard the Bowman rules them, grandson of Bane, son of Bard. He is a strong king, and his realm now reaches far south and east of Esgroth. And what of your own people? asked Frodo. Mm, there is much to tell, good and bad, said Gloin. Yet it is mostly good. We have so far been fortunate, though we do not escape the shadow of these times. If you really wish to hear of us, I will tell you tidings gladly. Well, stop me when you are weary. Dwarves' tongues run on when speaking of their handiwork, they say. And with that, Gloin embarked on a long account of the doings of the Dwarf Kingdom. He was delighted to have found so polite a listener, for Frodo showed no sign of weariness and made no attempt to change the subject, though actually he soon got rather lost among the strange names of people and places that he had never heard of before. He was interested, however, to hear that Dane was still king under the mountain, and was now old, having passed his 250th year, venerable and fabulously rich. Of the ten companions who had survived the battle of five armies, seven were still with him. Dwalin, Gloin, Dorin, Nori, Biffer, Bofur, and Bombur. Bombur was now so fat that he could not move himself from his couch to his chair and table, and it took six young dwarves to lift him. And what has become of Balin and Ori and Oin? asked Frodo. A shadow passed over Gloin's face. You do not know, he answered. It is largely on account of Balin that I have come to ask the advice of those that dwell in Rivendell. <laughs> but tonight, let us speak of merrier things. Loin began then to talk of the works of his people, telling Frodo about their great labors in Dale and under the mountain. We have done well, he said. But in metal work we cannot rival our fathers, many of whose secrets are lost. We make good armor and keen swords, but we cannot again make mail or blade to match those that were made before the dragon came. Only in mining and building have we surpassed the old days. You should see the waterways of Dale, Frodo, and the fountains and the pools. You should see the stone paved rows of many colors, and the halls and cavernous streets under the earth, with arches carved like trees, and the terraces and towers upon the mountain sides. Then you would see that we have not been idle. I will come and see them if ever I can, said Frodo. 
How surprised Bilbo would have been to see all the changes in the desolation of Smog. Gloin looked at Frodo and smiled. You were very fond of Bilbo, were you not? He asked. Yes, answered Frodo. I would rather see him than all the towers and palaces in the world.